What's up? Welcome to the Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty PAX East panel. PAX, how are you guys doing? Yo, I'm gonna need more than that. I need more energy. PAX, how are you guys doing? There we go. There we go. Listen, that's the energy I want when I introduce these devs. Of course, we have the Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty devs here to talk about the game. I want to introduce them. Starting off, I want to bring out Gabe. Gabe, come on. Of course, Gabe is the VP at CD Projekt Red, uh, and he is also the Phantom Liberty and Project uh, Orion game director. Gabe, how's it going, man? All right, all right. Excited awesome. to be here. How's your packs going? Yeah, it's, it's good. I love PAX. It's my favorite convention. Hell yeah. I've been going since uh, back when it was called PAX Prime on the West, and then, of course, on the East here as well. Oh, see, we don't, we, don't, we don't pay attention to Prime, all right? Those are the enemies over yeah, the other all right, all right, all right. All right. Then. Now, I want to bring out Powell, or Pavel. Uh, Pavel is the Associate Game Director of Project Orion <laughs> and the Quest Director of Phantom Leary. Paula, how's it going? Uh, great to be here, my dears. Stoked to see you all. We've been on GDC for the last week. My voice is fucked. That's why I sound like this. I've been talking for a whole week. Uh, we did a couple interviews. We did 14 different talks on GDC. It's been intense. We flew this to you uh, tonight. We didn't sleep. A couple of us, if you hear someone speaking like me, they've been on GDC with me. I, I just love that right before this, we talked about whether or not we're going to curse or not. And I love that we decided that, hey, this is Cyberpunk 2077 we're talking about, so we're going to fucking curse, all right? We're going to say some bad words. <laughs> Next up, I want to bring out Igor. Let's get, let's get a uh, clap going for Igor. Igor is the creative director of Project Orion and also a Phantom Hi. Liberty veteran. Igor, welcome to the stage. Hi. How's it going, man? How's your packs going so far? My what? How's your PAX, e PAX East going? Perfect. Loving all the cosplays, uh, Cyberpunk ones in particular. Hey, John Silverhand, I see you. Oh, my Thank goodness. You. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Uh, we also have Sarah. Sarah, come on out. Woo! -hoo! Let's clap for Sarah. Now, Sarah is the lead quest designer of Project Orion and also another Phantom Liberty veteran. Sarah, how's your PAX East going so far? Well, uh, today's the first day. It's really awesome. S trying hard not to spend all my money on all the swag that you can get. So. Oh my goodness. It's so difficult. Now, are you also flying in from GDC as well? Yes. How are you holding up? Because I also did GDC. For those who don't know, GDC is the Game Developers Conference. Uh, it goes down in San Francisco. It's a full week. And so a lot of us came straight from GDC here to talk with you guys, hang out with you guys. How are you holding up? Yeah, trying very hard not to fall asleep. <laughs> Well, that's right now. We got to crank up the Cyberpunk soundtrack to kind of get you Please. awake. <laughs> Last but not least, I want to bring to the stage Casper. Woo! -hoo! It's time for Casper. Now, Casper is the Environment <laughs> Art Director of Project Orion and also another Phantom Liberty veteran. Casper, how are you doing, man? You're breaking shit. Um, <laughs> we got to get like, a, a curse word counter. So I think we're at what? Three so far? Oh, it's Polish crew and Gabe also is with us. Sarah's here, so uh, it's going to be fun, for sure. It's going to be a fun time. Are you enjoying your PAX East so far? Um, I'm not going to lie. The first target was to get Starbucks real quick here because also I slept like four hours on a, slept four hours on a plane from GTC, like Pablo said. But so far, so good. We did like a one round. It looks yep. amazing so far. Oh, yeah. See, that's, okay, that's where I want to start. Because we're here, we're in Boston, and you know I don't get to come out to Boston often. Right? This is the second time I've been to Boston. The first time was in 2019 for PAX East 2019. And Boston is so dope, man. And what I want to ask from you guys is like, when you're in Boston, what is, like, what is the go-to spot? What is the first thing you're doing? Is there a restaurant? Is there a kind of food? Are you just immediately coming to PAX? Like, what is the vibe for you when you come to Boston? You tell me, I'm gonna take notes. Well, because I mean, we're here like for three months and I'm actually, we are in this moment, at least we, um, I mean, we, I am, I am looking for places to go to eat and this is still very much fun to explore this place and the city itself, which is... I've been told awesome. the answer is Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, I think... I think I've been one, there. One way to put it is that we're not... I wouldn't say we've been here long enough to be authorities on the matter, mm -hmm. but, uh, but downtown is very cool and uh, where our office is at, we got some... Uh, cool retro arcade places that I like to defeat uh, Igor and Tekken at. No, why they are telling them this is... I use Eddie. Did you say Tekken? Tekken, yes, yes, yes. Tekken, Tekken 3. 
Oh, so you're retro, playing old retro, Tekken. Retro, yes. Oh my, have you played the new Tekken yet? No, actually, I haven't played it yet. Oh, you gotta but play I want the new to. Tekken. Yeah, yeah. You gotta, there's this character in there named Victor. Let me tell you, Victor is a beast. That yeah. guy can fight, yeah. No, you gotta pick up the new but Tekken. But Gabe plays Eddie, and it's just like, get on with the machine gun turning. Oh yeah, doing all the flares, doing all the, all the windmills. We gotta love Eddie. Yes. We gotta yes. love Eddie. Uh, any other Boston plans? Anything you guys have planned while you're in Boston for the rest of the week? I mean, uh, when I'm in Boston, I'm mostly visiting banks nowadays because I had uh, so many problems <laughs> with banking system. I can tell no, you. No, please, 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 please. We, we, know, we know, we know. I can tell you so many great stories, actually, about the American banking system. So, yes, I've been introduced to that. Visited a couple of times, had great conversations. So that's been my Boston experience so far. Oh, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Now, of course, this is the first time that Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty is being discussed with the game's key creators right here in front of an audience, which is really exciting. And like the first question that I want to ask about the game, right, is, you know, we are, we are six months, seven months past the release of Phantom Liberty. How does it feel? You know, like, again, the Phantom Liberty is, a DLC, is an expansion that I think so many of us loved and enjoyed and had a great time with. Seven months later, like, how does it feel to have put this thing out to the world? Um, it, it feels great. Like it was, I, I tell you, as we were leading up to launch, um, we were nervous. Yeah. For sure. Um, we kind of stuck to our guns about like feeling like the, the kind of right decisions we wanted to make, what we wanted to expand, what we wanted to do with 2.0 and Phantom Liberty. And we felt, you know, confident amongst ourselves, but you just never know. You never know until it's out there in the public. And so six months afterwards, uh, definitely quite a relief, feeling yeah. good that it went well and players seemed to enjoy it. Was, it, was there any, ever any worry coming out in 2023? Because with 2023 in video games, we're talking about a lot of big games, right? Sure, we're talking right. about Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, you know, we're talking about Baldur's Gate 3, we're talking about Starfield, right? And like, you guys are coming out with this big RPG release in a year full of big RPG releases. Was that ever a worry for you guys? Go ahead, Igor, <laughs> if you want to take it. Go ahead and answer. I didn't go ahead, that. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, sure. But I think we felt that we have something unique, uh, something that no one else has. So, of course, it's an RPG, but we went into a very specific direction with it and kind of unique one as well with the uh, spy thriller genre, which was our idea, and we're going to talk more, more about it. So we kind of knew, of course, a lot of competition, but also that we have something that yeah, no one else has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, how about for you guys, right? Like, again, coming out in, the, in, in fall 2023, a packed year for video games. I know for me, the thing that uh, I really had fun with in our Game of the Year discussions at Kind of Funny and just in general were, oh man, this expansion is so good. Can we put it on our Game of the Year list even? And I saw you guys were making like, a lot of Game Awards nominations and, and, and whatnot. Did that surprise you to get those nominations despite being an expansion? I mean, absolutely, it surprised us. You know, like, you always do your best, but you never really know exactly how it's going to land. Because, like, at the end of the day, you are the judge and executioner, you know, uh, so to say. So you vote with, uh, you know, with your voice, with your wallets, with what you say on social media, with, uh, you know, word of mouth, you know, what you say, tell your friends, how much time you spend on the game with your reviews. All of that, you know, counts. And, you know, at the end of the day, we never really know exactly, kind of like Gabe pointed out. So, you know, all of those nominations are, of course, wonderful. I mean, we've been uh, with Gabe in um, Game Awards last year, and, and we got the uh, Game Award for um, uh, the, the... Ongoing. Ongoing game, exactly. That's yeah. the, way it's, the way it's called. And that was, in a way, a surprise for us, you know? The fact that you appreciated that. Um, and, like, soon after, we dropped uh, 2.1 with Metro System, <laughs> with Hangouts, with your partners, and so on, because we kind of knew uh, you really wanted. So, you know, you do work as much as you can. You hope for the best. But then, at the end of the day, the players are the ones that make the judgment. How long does that honeymoon stage last with a, re with a release, right? Like, again, we are six to seven months past uh, Phantom Liberty coming out. I know you guys are working on the next thing, Project Orion, which I'm sure plenty of us here are excited about. Are you guys still thinking about... Oh, yeah, you can go ahead and clap. You can give applause for that. Thank you. Are you guys still thinking about, uh, you know, the, uh, like the post-release of uh, Phantom Liberty, or are you guys just on to the next thing? I mean, we are... We are having a lot of fun on to the next thing, no doubt about that. But do we still uh, think about it, still play, still uh, talk about the, the little updates coming out and stuff like that? Um, yeah, for sure. 
And as we're approaching uh, Project Orion, for sure we think about it in terms of you know, what, what worked, what do we want to um, uh, push even farther, just uh, sort of generally speaking with the experience and how we approach the different, a bunch of different systems and content yeah. in the game. So yeah, it's, it's very much part of our conversation still, I guess yeah. is one way to put it. So how, I'll go for it if you want to. I mean, I, I really never really forgot <laughs> about it. Never really stopped thinking about it because like just after we dropped a patch 2.1, which was the complete edition of Cyberpunk, then we started working on 2.11, a uh, patch then 2.12. So <laughs> as Gabe said, it was very much in the conversation. You always have so many ideas, you know, when you work on a game, uh, you know, of what you could do p potentially, you know, hypothetically, you know, what would be built nice, what would fit. So we always discuss those things, you know, we are all creatives. We all have um, so many ideas, you know, of how we could enrich that game for you. So that's always something that stays with us. So what's the relationship with the game now, right? Like, the one thing I always wonder for developers is, you know, you make this game, it's a big open world action RPG that, you know, people get to uh, play, right? And like, you've spent years and years and years with this thing, working on it. Do you guys play the game when it comes out? Like, are you guys, you know, experiencing the game alongside uh, the fans? Do you guys still play the game? Like, what is that like? Yeah, sure, but usually you need to take a little, like, break before, between when you finish and you're actually ready to play it, wait for the patches and so on. Yeah, I mean, we... <laughs> <laughs> nice one, nice one. Now, we, um, uh, we play, like, regularly. It was part of our development process. So we played a whole bunch leading up to the launch. Uh, but I can say, myself personally, once it was launched, then I was able to kind of uh, take a breather mm. and now have like my character on you know, my computer, my console, and get my achievements and get that 100%. And I felt like I don't have to worry about all the little things I see as much, so I was able to be a lot more free with my character at that point. So yeah, I absolutely played. Yeah, you what can, about you, Sarah? Yeah, you can just kind of play um, about like 30 hours into my third playthrough right now, uh, because I started again after Phantom Liberty, but I had to stop at some point again, and played something else, and now I'm just always coming back to it, play it through a few hours, and then, yeah. But yeah, I enjoy it, as, even as, as developer, just to then dive into the story and just play it instead of constantly being on and, yeah, okay, this, we need to improve this and this and this and this. Yeah, and also the game is so huge that sometimes when you do one discipline, you don't really even know what's out there, right? And even as a developer, you discover new stuff always, yeah. Yeah, I feel like from, from my perspective, this was the most played game during development I've ever did. Like, we, wow. I played this game so much, I, I almost know every corner. Um, but still, for me, when I even play this game right now, as a, trying to be as a gamer, not developer, because sometimes it's really hard to what Igor said, to detach. It's really hard because you see this, oh, I want to change this, I want to change that, or why we didn't do this the other way around. But it's still fun. It's annoying, uh, not annoying, actually, it's amazing that you, well, when I play the game after like, beating this game 20, 30 times, it's still fun. Even the same scenes, I'm trying to see how I can approach that. Uh, on top of that, it's still, that's the small part of me being a developer that I'm thinking about, what would happen if we change those things differently? What will happen with the game if we use the different concept part or the different direction that we were talking about, which was still awesome idea? This would be a completely different game. And it's, 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 it's super nice to see this flow of ideas, like days and ideas talking about those and, and giving this product that uh, just never get, get old, basically. That's awesome. Do, do you ever still experience surprises? You know, Sarah talks a little bit about you know, finding things that you might knew, not knew were there. Have you guys ever had an experience while playing Cyberpunk or Phantom Liberty where you get to a thing and you're like, oh, that's crazy. Didn't, know that, didn't expect to see this here. Yes. Yeah? Um, and then sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll pull up my Slack message and be like, Sasuke, what is this? <laughs> Who snuck this in Where here? this came from? <laughs> yeah, he's we a, had that conversation multiple times, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's, he's a master, and him and his crew of just, like... Because part of that RPG open-world experience is, is, like, the Easter eggs. It's the exploration. It's the environmental storytelling. And there's just so much of it throughout that it's almost impossible for any one of us to, like... Um, have seen it all during development. And so the surprises keep coming. I remember the, uh, the, the oh, I guess, uh, by the way, by the way, how many people have played Phantom Liberty and are okay with us spoiling stuff? <laughs> all right, all I'm right. I'm curious, who here has not played Phantom Liberty? There's like someone, you like. Clap. I wanna hear you, I wanna hear you clap. <laughs> okay. So it's like half and half. It's First like of all, <laughs> if you haven't played Phantom Liberty, you gotta play Phantom Liberty, it's great. Yes, yes. So, 
Um, goodness, it's going to be tough, uh, I'll be honest, to not spoil things as we're talking kind of openly here, but I guess we'll do our best. Um, as long as you don't spoil the ending. I feel like that's the big thing. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, we won't go to the ending. But we are going to show a video, I believe, that's about a third of the way in, halfway in, depending on how you slice it. Um, so there's that. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, I remember finding a... a, 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 a doom like game <laughs> and being like being like how did did engineers work on this how did you guys do this how did you pull this off and it was quest design sorcery yes it was quest design sorcery it was one of our quest designers and with the help of level design a really passionate person and gabe was asking me like who actually from engineers worked on it and i'm like no one and gabe is like okay who made the gameplay well Quest designers did. So who did this? Well, Quest designers did. So yeah, we just kind of plotted it together. We really wanted to, um, for you to have something like this. It's a secret, it's pretty deeply hidden. If you don't know what we are talking about, maybe you can Google it and find it for yourself. That was even a secret for me, man. When I saw it, I was like blown away. It was fantastic. Absolutely great. Yeah, but yeah. Great job. And I mean, and this is part of like what we try to um, kind of encourage one another to do. Obviously do it in a responsible way, but just give Which that way? freedom. <laughs> what way? All right, all right. We're not going to get into too much of a dev talk, so to speak. But yeah, give that freedom to be able to do that. And it's a very important thing because that passion, it's impossible for it to be all kind of like managed um, top down, so to speak, but instead empowering everyone to be able to do these things. Um, yeah, I really like personally, like as a manager, uh, when we are working with our teams to always try to use the method, you know, yes and. So when someone comes with an idea to me, I really, really need to have like a, a serious reasons to say no. And I really try to find reasons how I can tell them yes or direct them a bit. Because like sometimes they really have passion and have an idea of like what to do. Uh, you know, there's for instance the Growl contest, uh, Growl FM that we had in the game. Um, and one of our quest designers, Maria Mazur, she really wanted to like give a bit more spotlight for the artists that we have in the game who won the contest. And she had a couple of ideas how to do it, you know, and so on. So she just needed like a, a, a tiny bit of direction to which to go, but everything else she did on her own. Uh, just because she wanted, because it was something that was important to her. And it's really important when you work with creatives to, in a way, have that, in a way, bond, but also be able to direct them and empower them like this. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I love hearing about the yes and that you have in the development room, right? Because I think that sort of speaks to some of the yes and that can happen within the game as well. You know, there are a few moments while playing Phantom Liberty where, you know, I for me had the moments where I was like, oh, this is, this is awesome. This is fucking awesome. Add that to the counter. This is fucking awesome, right? Like, one of the ones for me was, um, you know, in Phantom, or sorry, in Cyberpunk 2.0, you know, you redid the skill tree and you added in a lot of new stuff there. And one of those things was the, um, the katana, uh, like deflecting bullets with a katana. And, you know, I started specking towards that way, right? To be a bit more of like a, you know, fast samurai that like you know could zoom everywhere and I'm I'm in this side quest in the Phantom Liberty area in Dog Patch and you know I am getting into this standoff with a couple of NPCs and they have sort of their mob boss that's like about to like call down his goons to start a fight with me. And you know, as he started, as he as the conversation is working its way toward that, I am thinking like, oh, I know where this is going. Like this is gonna turn into a fight. This is gonna turn into a shootout. And so I have my finger just hovering on the button to like bust out the katana and deflect the bullets. And as soon as the, the, the mob boss finally goes, get him. And I'm like, all right, bet. And I like I press the L1 button and they start shooting and I start deflecting all the bullets. And it was one of the coolest things that, that's ever happened to me in the video game. Because it worked exactly exactly how I thought it was going to work. I start dashing around, I start shotgunning people in the face. And for me, that's an example of a yes and, a yes and moment for me, right? Like, I can see the scenario going one way and I'm able to react to that. So that's the thing that I really, I, I think the more in, in the development room where you can go, okay, yeah, like what ideas do you have? What can you bring to the table? Okay, how do we see, how do we implement these things to the game, right? I think that reflects on the player end where it is, okay, I feel like I am part of setting the scene now as a player. And so I just wanted to shout that out because I love that aspect of Cyberpunk 2077. Awesome, uh, great to hear. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, on the other side, right, like you put out, again, this big game, uh, you know, Cyberpunk 2077 originally came out uh, toward the end of 2020. It's now years later, you put out Phantom Liberty late last year. And it's in a place now where you put out 2.0, you put out the expansion, the game feels like it's, you know, in this complete stage now. 
If you can go back, is there anything that you would change about the game? Well, I mean, uh, as creators, we, we kind of always feel like this. Yeah. Mm. And, um, I mean, God, how do I... So, part of our process is doing, like, retrospectives of, like, okay, what content, what systems, what themes worked, what didn't work, what sort of worked, so on and so forth. And then we take this and we apply it to our next thing, right? We, we actually start at Phantom Liberty that way, we, 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 and 2.0. We were treating it like a sequel. How do we want to iterate on this stuff? What do we want to, we want V to have more of a kind of voice in uh, the choices that she makes impacting Johnny, uh, choices that she makes impacting the main characters, right? So we lean into that with Phantom Liberty. Um, same thing with like gameplay, you were mentioning gameplay. One of the big things was, when you approach the, the, the cyberpunk universe, what are some of your fantasies? What are some of your ideas if you have cyberware? And how do we approach that? So, in the same way, it's like, what are the, some of the things you would have changed and done differently? We're taking some of that to Orion creativity, and so this is, this is where I get to my punchline where it's like, it's difficult for me to answer this question without giving away Orion kind of design mm. spoilers. <laughs> I know, I know, right? Just one. <laughs> after, after a couple of drinks, maybe. But I just got here. Yeah, what'd you do with um, Let's grab a drink. Maybe, maybe one of y'all got one that you can throw out uh, I mean, safely. It, we kind of touch upon that. Creative process is very hard. It's, it, you, you never know what's going to end up at the end of the line. You have ideas, but the game might be absolutely different because iterative process, talking, thinking. Um, the one thing that, from my perspective, uh, was kind of known was the dog down, right? We knew the dog was going to be there. When we had the pitch for the game, um, of course, for me, was always Escape from New York, right? Which is one of the greatest movies ever. And I like that movie so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> and uh, building this world, having these ideas, it was always there, right? Yeah. But there's so much more you can do to make those ideas be your, your own unique. Because whenever, whenever we build a world, a cyberpunk is not fantasy world. It's actually a world based on real life rules, right? This was one of the biggest uh, building blocks for, for our games, it's trying to build the worlds in a way that everyone can understand those things, right? So they're based on real life events, real life um, logic. There's no dock down, there's no night city to go to take pictures, references, there's nothing like that. So we, all of us, with our art directors, Pavel and Kuba back in Poland, we're trying to make this world believable. So that was known. But all those small twists and turns and ideas, even now we can make the dock down to be absolutely different if, if we had to probably, because again, the process never the same. It was still much, much more fun to talk about it and, and actually make it work. That's awesome. Also, I realized they're called Dogtown Dog Patch earlier. That's the San Francisco I, thing. I caught that. Yeah, we have a neighborhood funny. called Dog Patch, and so I always intermix them. But oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Now, I got to talk about it, right? The casino scene. My favorite moment in Cyberpunk 2077, Phantom Liberty. We have a video that we want to pull up uh, that shows a little bit about uh, the casino scene, but like, there is so much happening here, right? Like, you know, you have a concert going on, you have the casino, you have a game of spies, you have like, you know, a lot of like covert, like, you know, spy movie vibes going on. There is so much going on in this scene. For you guys, would you consider this sort of the pinnacle of what you're able to do with the, the Phantom Liberty expansion? Well, we, we try to have one pinnacle in every quest, actually. And if you think about it, there's like a banger every like couple of scenes or, um, or minutes. Uh, this one, um, it addresses a specific fantasy. So taking a step back, like this whole expansion in, uh, in opposite to the ba base game, which is like this huge open world and you need to actually have a lot of like different genres and themes and stories to fill the world. Phantom Liberty is shorter, it's more concise and we could focus on one specific, specific theme. In our case or genre, it was a spy thriller. But then even for the spy thriller, like you have so many different aspects to it and different fantasies within it. We always start designing our stories from real world, from like the actual reality, something that's like relatable and feels true. But we also try to add this, let's say, pop culture spin on it. And in Phantom Liberty, we knew we want to hit those marks for uh, Mission Impossible, for Bourne, for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, and for James Bond. And this sequence oh, yeah. is actually, this is what we told ourselves, let's do a proper James Bond story, fantastic party, you mingling with the most powerful people, trying to stay cool at the same time, doing this mission undercover. And then like with this top idea, let's say in mind, we approached every single beat in this. This is, by the way, usually how we work. For each both scene and sequence, we try to find this one like director's statement, something really short, 
um, but like encompassing the whole vision. It's more about like the feeling you want to get. And James Bond party is like is one of those. And then you every choice you make, you try to does it does it work for this James Bond plus cyberpunk theme? If it does, you do it. If it doesn't, you try something else. Yeah, I mean, great, great point. That's something that we learned actually when working on Phantom Liberty, that when we define very precisely the genre and a theme, it's so much easier for us to actually define what will be in that quest, but also to cascade the vision to the team. When you're working with creatives, it's really, really difficult sometimes to really explain the vision and be sure that you're on the same page. You know, when I say a chair, each of you probably sees a different chair in your mind. You know, someone says a beach chair, another one says a plast plastic one, another wooden one. You know, imagine how it is when you have a room full of creative people and you're discussing a nuanced, complex ideas. The themes and genres, when we define them, help so much to actually guide the team and help them out. And probably like somewhat damaged from Phantom Liberty, you know, the, the quest in a bunker uh, with a certain uh, Cerberus following you, without many spoilers, um, is the one that has a very clearly defined genre. And it helped us out so much to actually guide the team. And often, actually, we had this conversation when team had a great ideas, but they didn't really fit to that genre or what we wanted to do. And through actually repeating them, you know, okay, this is exactly what we are building here. The, everyone was pretty much on the same page. And there was a moment when everyone actually understood what we are putting together. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, because I'm, I'm really trying my best right now to figure out that it's not GDC anymore, it's PAX. Yeah, Although, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to go a bit technical here because it's all cool, it's all fun whistles. But guys, this is also a game. It has very hard limitation from technical point of view. And some ideas even might be great, but not, we might not be able even to put them in. Like for example, uh, the casino scene is a great scene because this was the hot, uh, outside of Black Stadium was the most heavy scene in the whole game because of the biggest crowds. There's an awesome vista for the whole night city. You can take a look and, uh, and just looks awesome. Although it makes the whole thing so much more challenging. So, Outside of Pavel said, aligning every single team in the company just to make sure the same vision for this scene, for, the, for this environment, for the whole flow for the quest, and then make it even work on our hardware, that's another complicated layer of complexity. So it's, it's fun, and when it works, you're like, oh my god, it happened, it worked. It's, it's absolutely a great feeling, although it's stressful sometimes to get there, right? And Gabe's like, why this shit doesn't work? <laughs> No, I want to I um, like drill in a little bit like uh, um, closer to the ground, so to speak, and give like an anecdote of some of the stuff as we're trying to accomplish it. Because early on, I remember we had conversations or whatever about like the whole idea of Bond suddenly opening. Because right before this scene, you, you put on your outfit, right? You, you change, you infiltrate it. So you got that whole spy fantasy and you put on the outfit. And we wanted to have it there where you just like open the door and then you're right there in the party. And it's like, and then you grab the, the, the martini or the champagne. Not mar we, didn't go, we didn't go that far uh, with the Bond uh, metaphor. And then you're in the party and you're just blending in, right? But we did some level design and some environment art and it ended up being that the entrance to the area was farther away and then you could just totally see the party from afar and you were approaching it. And so it, 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 it lost some of that punch that we wanted. And so we did a lot of different iteration to kind of like put certain pillars in certain locations, certain angles, certain fog elements. Um, and then we wanted to have you like walking. And then, and then it was like, oh, that's too long of a walk and there's not enough interesting stuff before you get there. And so we were like, okay, let's sync up some people coming out of the elevator and maybe them talking or whatever. And we're like, okay, we did that. And it's not quite enough. Now let's have Reed saying some stuff. And it's like, nah. Reed's being too talkative. He's a super spy. He'd be chill. He wouldn't be talking as much, right? So we had V saying a few nervous things or whatever. And it still wasn't quite enough. And then someone came up with the idea to put Johnny there to be talking about, damn, there's a party, <laughs> you know? And it was like, oh, that's so perfect, right? Like Johnny commenting on a party to bridge you to it. And then when you get down, when you get in there and you kind of come around the corner and then you do have the reveal for the party and Reed's walking down in front of you, then there was the big, you remember the debate about, 
do you grab the champagne at the top of the stairs or the bottom of the okay. stairs, right? Like this was like the, the nuance we were getting into with like trying to really get that fantasy across. And at first we had it at the top of the stairs and you're kind of sipping it as you're going down. And then we're like, oh, no, 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 no. But part of the party is eavesdropping on people. So we want you to get down into the party. And then when you're grabbing the champagne, there's someone in ear, you know, uh, ear range or whatever, hearing range, that you would hear them talking about other people in the party. And then I remember us debating about, about like, what do people talk about when they're at these kind of parties? And I remember at one point we had a, a version where it was like, this party's cool or this party's not so great or whatever, commenting on a party. And we we're like, no, 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 no. These are like the worst of the worst corporatocracy. We want to hear some like bad, yeah, we, some we, dirt. We want that we, fucked up shit. We want the fucked up shit, yes. Add it to the counter. And so, and so we started with that. As you're grabbing the champagne, someone is like directing you to, oh, like, oh that's, that's NCPD talking with Hanson over there. And of course, if you were paying attention in the story earlier, Hanson's got the propaganda of like, fuck NCPD, fuck NCPD. But then you see when you're in this party, they're just doing their handshake deals, right? And so, well, I, I can keep going, I can keep going. Go ahead, Igor, or, or Sarah. No, for, and, you know, for me the thing is that's only like one conversation about one specific scene that we're having. I don't know, imagine this having this contact type of conversations for pretty much everything because I remember how we, for example, iterated also like on the opening gate, right? Or what would be presented when you go into the stadium for the first time. So yeah, it's just like lots of ideas that get thrown around and to make like everything perfect. Yeah, and these conversations like they keep happening in iterations over months actually. And I think this is part of like being the developer skill is to every time you like play the game again, you test it, to try to imagine it as if someone was playing it for the first time. And it's really difficult after you saw the same thing like 50th time, every time you really need to like reset yourself and like, is the pacing good? Is like, am, am I looking where, where the players were looking? Is it like, is it, does it all flow well? Yeah. And it's really easy to lose it. Yeah, and just to underline that, it's a very different ball game when it's like open world, like an open area and you can go every different direction as opposed to it's linear. And so, yeah, we had all these considerations in the party because we wanted the party to be kind of like exploration and you find stuff throughout it. Oh, oh, we're on the casino scene. Sorry, go ahead, Sasuke. Oh, just, just one comment to sum up what, what Gabe was talking about. So as you can see, actually, when we are constructing those sequences, those minute details matter a lot. Really like having a pillar in the right place, having a moment where the drink is given completely sometimes changes the feeling you have. And we as, a, as a developers, as designers, what we are trying to do, we are trying to direct your thoughts and your feelings when you're playing the game. To really take you with us for this adventure, to in a way seduce you for this really epic story. And we can lose you even having a pillar in a wrong fucking place. You know what I mean? Like that really tiny thing can actually change so much. Yeah, the same with the timing. It's like literally you sometimes leave three seconds too much of like idle time and players are like already... It's like Uncanny Valley. Yeah, it's like yeah. this is awkward. This doesn't feel real anymore. Authentic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you're talking about pacing. I do... Uh, one thing I want to shout out is, yeah, I think you guys absolutely nailed the pacing uh, in this entire scene. Um, and I, I think one way that you know that the pacing is good is when... You know, there are certain set piece events happening, right? Like the one I'll chat out is the concert. We saw it a little bit earlier in the video where, you know, you have the performer coming out on stage and then you have like the big wings lighting up behind her. When I was playing the game, I couldn't help but to stop and just stare. Be like, oh, this is so cool, right? And the fact that for me as a player, I was like, yo, I'm gonna pause for a second and I'm just gonna watch this thing happen because like, this is so cool. I think that is a, a, a sign of like how well that is paced, right? That I wanna take my time, that I wanna like, you know, take it all in. I wanna shout out that. I also wanna shout out how good Idris Elba looks in this game. <laughs> Right you guys nailed Solomon Reed's character. Like, you know, even as I was watching it earlier in the video, I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's Idris, man. That's like, that's my guy from Luther. I love Luther. I, I love that you got him for the game. And also seeing him in, in Keanu Reeves, you know, like kind of in the same scene side by side. Cool shit. Like, that's some, that's some fucking awesome. Funny, funny inside to that. Sorry, I don't know. Maybe you, you were going to say it, but when Idris saw himself and he was studying and he's like, it's good. He's like, you made me a little bit more buff than I am. Thank you. <laughs> Because he's slightly, he's slightly like stronger bulkier. Yeah, so I, I actually wanted to tell a different story. When I was talking to Idris, I was actually telling him how much we have been studying his face. 
Because the thing is that he has, he is playing in a very specific way and his facial poses are the ones that we couldn't really fully recreate using our rig that we had in a given time. And there's two things that are like identified by our, our animators that are like really iconic and important for his face. And there's, it's his left lid that is slightly slower than the right lid and is slightly lower as well. And second thing is his frown between his eyes, the frown. And getting that frown right was really the moment when that face really started looking like him. Because when you have a great texture, you know, animations and all that, it was almost there and we could see him, but the moment when we get that frown right and get our riggers actually to update the face rig and really make it sure that it works, and you know, our animators spent a lot of hours just studying his face. And I remember talking to Idris about it, and he was amazed <laughs> how well I knew his face because I heard all about all of those details, and I was able to tell him exactly how his face works. That's amazing. I like the idea that you told that to him. He's like, we got to call the police. <laughs> we got to call somebody. <laughs> this man's been studying my face. That's incredible. Man, well, shout out to the casino scene. Uh, I, I want to move on, but do we have any last words about the casino scene? I mean, there's so much that we can say for so long. This part right here, right? Like, I remember us having conversations about the anticipation of like, is Reed alive? What's Reed's situation? And building it just right with the beats and, 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 and Alex talking to you in the elevator. And when you come down, we want it the non-linearity. We talk about non-linearities a lot. We want it like, if you were able to pull off that working really well with Reed in the, in the section before, the sniping section before, that then they would let you pass. But if you muck that up, then they'd be like, recognize you and they'd be all on top of you. So yeah, so, I, I mean, we could talk about this scene for quite a while. Igor, did you wanted to add something? Look like you're about to. I would like to, but no. No, go for it, go for it. No, we, we got, got time. time. Mm -hmm. We got time? Okay. Yeah. No, for example, like even the, 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 the roulette scene, uh, I remember um, this is kind of like you try to take the genre and that cyberpunk spin on top of it. So like we knew that we will, uh, like in the game, you will be pretending to be someone else, but we started with like, okay, so maybe we'll just scan their faces and get masks. And then we, it's kind of like, yes, and, and we try to push it further. Like, but what can you do even more in cyberpunk world? Maybe you can fully steal their identity, like everything, how they move, their tone, their like micro movements. So maybe let's make this scene about actually stealing like the whole personas, not just scanning their faces. So, um, yeah, and I have 20 more anecdotes. That's awesome. <laughs> so, question for you guys. Again, I love talking to you guys as developers, right? Because you guys are on the other side of, you know, working on the game, making these things. You're talking about all these decisions that you're making to make sure that, you know, you're curating the experience just right for the players. How is it like, you know, when the game first comes out, right? Like, is it a nervous feeling? Are you immediately like on Metacritic being like, oh, what are they saying about it? You know, like, what is, what is that feeling like? Well, I think there's different ways to cope. Go ahead, go ahead, I Sarah. would just say it's terrifying, as simple as that. Um, so, for, and I know how it went actually guys for you, but for me, I was, I was stressed, as everyone was. But someone dropped the uh, GameSpot 10, right? The first review. And we're like, okay, now we're, we're, now we're talking. So that, <laughs> the first 10 was like, for sure, there's not going to be only 10s, but it shows that GameSpot, which is harsh in their reviews, gave us 10. That means there's something there. And definitely going to be proud of that. Uh, because what was said before, you never know. You, you, you can do something creatively awesome for you subjectively, but you never know how the reception is going to be. So it's always terrifying. There's never golden rule that you're going to follow and you know this game is going to be awesome. If that would be the, the case, we would have only great games, which is unfortunately not the case. So terrifying for me was the best word to describe my feelings at that time. Yeah, for me it was kind of a mix of the fine line between anxiety and excitement that was constantly writing and constantly switching between them because, you know, I kind of felt it was great, but at the same time you don't know, so I'm going from, yeah, we're releasing to, oh shit, we're releasing, how will it work out? And back to, yeah, we're releasing, ding, 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 ding. So yeah, that was my take on it. I mean, I'm always uneasy uh, before the release. I remember the release of Witcher 2 and Hans Edition, Witcher 3, then uh, Cyberpunk and then Phantom Liberty. And believe me, like, each one of them felt different um, by, because of many reasons. But there was always this one thing that kind of unifies that and is this deep anxiety. 
You know, when you just look at it and you think like, what's gonna happen, you know? You know when sort of the embargo, uh, you know, goes down, that is the moment when all the review, reviews drop, right? And then you go to the Metacritic and then refresh it, and then whoever finds the first uh, sort of review sends it to our internal channel saying like, hey, the first review is there, you know? And then in a way that sort of builds up you know, how you're feeling, and then you start, slowly start to breathe. You know, that's, that's really, really how it feels, you know? You jump to forums, to Reddit, um, other places really to check what people are saying. And it's, um, it's really terrifying, uh, honest. <laughs> it's a really terrifying feeling. I take a, a different approach. I completely don't look at anything. Really? Um, yeah, I just, I, and I wait for someone on my team that I know is, um, cynical or harsh to come up to me and be like, hey, it's all right. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, okay. And then once I get enough of that, then I'm like, okay, now I'll look. Now I'll look. Okay. Uh, yeah, but then when it is okay, oh, then you just take it all in. Yeah. I just like yeah. spend hours reading every fucking review, and then like my favorite thing is just like react, like um, uh, YouTubers playing with like you know w w when when you can see their reactions live, and like when they cry, I'm just like, give me give me more. It's like yeah. you know, <laughs> vampire. Are you literally vampire. drinking your tears? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and for me, it's it's not just the releases, right? For me, I kind of have this feeling like every time we we do something like major, like for example, I still remember the the Keanu Reeves reveal that we did, yeah. and I was just watching hours and hours on end just on reaction videos of people That's getting awesome. excited, right? And it's just like oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah, I, I, I still do it when I'm sad. Yes, like I go on me the too. And just like. <laughs> That's yeah, when I want to hype myself, I definitely look at the 2018, uh, you know, when we hacked the conference and the uh, Microsoft conference and, and the reveal in 2019, Keanu on the stage. I was actually fortunate enough to be there in person. So I was just waiting for like, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes to this finally happen. And when this whole like, stadium almost erupted, when he actually walked out, you know, everything was shaking. Seriously, like that feeling when he was there and actually how perfectly it played out, you know, because like Keanu is a very like humble man and this mix of like shyness and him actually trying to talk to the people about what he wanted to tell them. But in, in the same time, he was like kind of caught off guard by the reaction of people to him and that mix of feelings. It was incredible to see really. And the, these reactions and there's so many compilations, right? On YouTube of people reacting to that moment or to hacking the conference. And there's been a couple moments like this in the history of, of our studio that I often come back to. It's also when it happens, I mean, in this case, fortunately it was great release. It's a, it's a super nice uh, team let's say, celebration, right? Because you can sit down, give a high five, give a hugs, and you're like, you're happy, yes, we did it. It was hard, it was terrifying, it was tough, but it was worth it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I, I love this moment, because it just shows that all this hard work, all this unease, you never know what's gonna happen, you have to just be brave, go for it, trust yourself, trust the, trust the instinct, trust the teamwork, and, uh, and, and it just, it just, it's just great. It's, it's, it makes the all hard moments, dark times, just go away instantly. That's awesome. Let me tell you, I still, I still can't get over how good the Keanu Reeves reveal was, you know, at that show. Like, I remember, you know, uh, I must have been either at home or I might have been reacting to it with our channel. And, like, yeah, it was a palpable energy in the room. Like, we couldn't believe uh, that moment. And so you guys absolutely nailed that one. And I probably feel like the room was shaking because it was pretty deep bass. <laughs> boom, boom. Okay. Probably. Also, like, maybe a small behind-the-scenes story uh, from that moment. Like, we were calling Keanu in the documents, in the official emails, Mr. Fusion. So that That's no so one, cool. <laughs> so that no one will actually figure out, like, our stars have nicknames uh, if we work with them. So that pretty much as little amount of people will know who that person is. And it was, like, difficult to keep it in secret for, like, years. Really, to, so that that never, you know, never really uh, came out, never leaked before, yeah. um, till the very moment when he actually walked in the stage. And because of that, yes, he was Mr. Fusion on all the emails, conversations, even like on Slack, on private, private conversations, even like when we were on the street in LA, just walking, we talked about Mr. Fusion. That's amazing. 
Mr. Fusion is such a cool name. Whoever came, with, came up with that absolutely nailed it. And let me tell you, like, I think Keanu Reeves at E3 is like one of the best E3 moments of all time. There's only way, one way to top it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Keanu. I'm just kidding. No, you're not. <laughs> that was good. That <laughs> was you, good. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, have it yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, sticking on the topic of you know uh, the reviews and being there day one at launch and all, and all that stuff. You know, like going back to 2020 with Cyberpunk, the original. You know, that launch and that uh, uh, like reception was a bit more rough, especially for CD Projekt Red. Right, coming off of The Witcher 3 is something that like was widely revere, reveal or revered. Uh, when Phantom Liberty came out. Did you guys have the confidence in it? Like, was that a, oh, we know this is good this time. Like, we know that this is it. Um, like I was saying earlier, I think uh, we felt good about it because we played it. We played a lot of it ourselves. Uh, we also did focus tests, and so we were feeling very proud, but we still were uneasy because you just never know, you know, that 1% or that 0.1% still gets you. But, um, yeah, we were feeling good going into it. We're like, we set out to uh, accomplish some things, and we felt like we did accomplish most of them. And um, w w one thing is that I, I would add to it, when we shipped Cyberpunk 2077, that was in 2020, that was during COVID, we also couldn't have, as a team, this moment of celebration because of many reasons, and COVID was also one of them. And we never were able to like, you know, meet each other, see each other, you know, hug each other, also because of uh, the reasons, you know, how the, game, how the game shipped. And then with Phantom Liberty, actually we had an actual release party in the company, and I remember those moments when actually, you know, we kind of like met as a team, and people hugged each other, and actually felt like, yeah, we made it. That's awesome. We really, really made it. So, and uh, I will just add, I'll just add one thought to it. You know, like, it's maybe hard to see it from a player's perspective, but when you work on triple A's, those are made for like five years, six years, 12 years, depending, you know, on the project IP uh, and the game. When you work on a game like that, sometimes you can just be a person who joins the industry, work for many, many years in a game, that game ships, and you don't have this moment of satisfaction. You don't have that moment of actually everyone really appreciating what you have built. And I really felt it for so many team members that we had, that we hired, you know, after Witcher 3, who joined us during Cyberpunk 2077, and they didn't have that moment, really. And like, I think that was probably the most devastating feeling for me, knowing that they didn't have that incredible catharsis, you know, that incredible moment at the end when everyone appreciates what you did. That's why it was, I think, so rewarding, that release party at the end when actually everyone, you know, all the people who were hired as juniors became specialists, specialists became seniors, people who were with us for a long time and finally had that really critical acclaim. It was an amazing moment for everyone in the team. That's incredible. That's awesome. So, in working in, on Phantom Liberty, uh, I guess internally in the studio of CD Projekt, right, what, what would you say were the things that changed the most between the launch of Cyberpunk 2077, the base game in 2020, and the launch of Phantom Liberty uh, years later? Well, so many, like almost everything, actually. It was, actually, the, the release of the base game was such a huge lesson for us, and sometimes, like, you grow only after you, you know, make mistakes, and sometimes mistakes are just the, the best ways to, to develop yourself. So we changed everything. Like the, the whole way we work from this very like s separated teams, really long term planning to the agile model. I won't bore you with like production details, but it's a huge, huge um, consequence in the, for the quality of game. We went basically, we created those multidisciplinary teams. So like each quest had this, uh, they're called pods in different companies. Um, content teams in our case, where you have like a couple, a couple of people from each discipline. Like so, you have both environment artists, cinematic uh, designers, you have s s story writers, quest designers, audio, VFX, lighting, and so on. And together, as a team, they work on some specific part of the quest. And it may seem obvious, but for the base game, we didn't work like this. You had a story team.
team and they were doing their own thing. A cinematic team, they were doing their own thing. And the way we mixed people, it gave our teams so much more like ownership and creativity. People also got like really much closer to each other. And this is something maybe I would like to speak a little bit about is how extremely necessary and valuable in game development is like the connections between people. Um, communication, something like that, that Pavel mentioned with the chair, but also just like trust in, in a way and feeling safe with others, especially when you're doing creative stuff. Like you need to feel safe to propose different stuff, to do yes and, yes and. And even if the idea is not always good, like you need to have space to be able to propose it um, because th th this is where like the magic happens when you really go from like the most obvious stuff to the cool stuff, the, the, the unique stuff that no one ever did. This is in the space of like safety and trust. And also on Phantom Liberty, we really knew each other already as a team. Like we are, we are all really close together, we trusted each other and we could have yes ended like through the design. That's awesome. So, you know, I asked about um, Cyberpunk 2077 to Phantom Liberty. Of course, the next game is coming, uh, Project Orion. You guys don't have much to say here, right? Like, you guys are still working on it. You guys are in the, what I like to say, deep in the Duffy right now, right? Like, you guys are in your bag working on, on that game. I'm sure making it great and all that stuff. What would you say is you're taking uh, from this experience of, you know, improving, changing, you know, based on uh, uh, that time between 2077 and the, the Phantom Liberty expansion? Is there anything that you're taking from that into making the next game? Um, yeah, I mean, we're taking, as uh, Igor was saying, the, the way that we have the, the cross-functional teams as well as kind of making sure that all the directors are kind of aligned so we can all kind of independently go out and manage teams and be able to empower them. Um, so like the, the methodology, the creative methodology, and, 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 and I want to add to a little bit of what Igor was saying about ideas, because uh, a little bit more nuance to that, it's very important to feel safe to give ideas, but feel safe to give like incomplete ideas. Because if you have to feel like your idea has to be fully rounded and fully presentable and defensible, then you're going to just hold it and you're not going to get anywhere. Whereas half ideas or even broken ideas might have a little bit that can be blossomed into something else. And so this, this methodology we're taking forward, we're already doing really. Um, and yeah, the trust, being through the trenches together. So what else are we taking? Again, there's, there's, there's certain lessons, certain things that we set out to do in Phantom Liberty that uh, went over well. And we want to kind of take some of those things and kind of crank it up to 11. Mm -hmm as well as add some more stuff. And that's, that's as much as I could say. I don't know, maybe one of you all have a way of kind of giving something without giving too much away. I, I think we can just talk about experience. Every project gives us experience, right? So we know how we can make some of the things and how then we can make it better, higher, bolder, whatever you're going to call it, crack it up to 11, 12, whatever. But you have this experience, right? And Cyberpunk gave us, I think, huge lesson on every single possible corner. So it's not like we're going to grab one idea for Cyberpunk and pull in Orion, it's just we have things that we tried, we, 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 we talked, we, we build the relationships. We, there are a lot of things just that are helping us to align on, on being more ambitious and go to bigger worlds. I guess maybe, sorry, one, one thing I could say is that one of the things that we, we set out to do in Phantom Liberty and I think went well was um, just the synergy between narrative, gameplay, and world building and art and understanding that we're making a video game, not necessarily a movie, though there's parts that, are, that feel movie-esque for sure, but the idea of it's the unique medium and it's about the intersection of those four things to deliver an emotion and experience together and complementing each other. That is like a quintessential sort of pillar that we take into Orion and, and crank up to 11, so to speak. That's as, that's as much as I can give, I think. That's awesome. <laughs> Gabe, Pavel, Igor, Sarah, um, Casper, thank you guys so much for joining me here. Uh, we're uh, running out of time. There's still a couple things I want to shout out and want to do uh, real quick, but I want to thank you guys for one, letting me, be my, letting me be your host, right? But then also sharing so much about the development of Cyberpunk and the future of uh, Project Orion. Uh, crowd, can we get an applause for the developers of Cyberpunk 2077? Now, uh, before we get out of here, there's a couple of things. 
uh, we are going to have a meet and greet with the developers uh, right outside. And so if you want to talk to these folks, uh, you know, we're going to be out there. So introduce yourself, talk to them, tell them how much you love the game, tell them much, how much you love the expansion, all that good stuff. One more thing, though. We want to take a picture with the audience, right? We want to take a picture with the cyberpunk uh, community. And so we're going to have somebody come out. Uh, I want you guys to stand up. Let's position ourselves. If you got like a cyberpunk shirt, or like, let's all stand up. First of all, let's stand up. Let's get the house lights on. If you got cyberpunk shirts or any kind of CD Projekt merch, flare them up. I guess I'll take it. I don't know if anybody's coming out. <laughs> OK, we're going to do selfie style. It is going to be the biggest selfie on PAX. All right, three, two, one. There we go. We got it. There we go. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. We'll see you later. It's been our pleasure to serve you. See you, everybody. Thank you so much. Your breath take.